Welcome back, everyone, to the Orthodox Squad podcast. It has been a while, but we have a great one for you today. Uh, I'm your host, OMS, as always. We have Sky Milos Strachinia just came back. Um, our, I think Carl's sleeping right now. I forgot about all of this, but that's fine. <laughs> um, well, we have a special guest today, Father John Whitefort. Welcome. Thanks for having me on. Before we start, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, if people don't know you that are watching? Okay, well, um, I was raised um, in the Church of the Nazarene. As most people don't know what that is. They ask, well, what's that? And uh, I used to say that they were like conservative Methodists with Baptist tendencies, but now they're more like <laughs> moderate Methodists with Baptist tendencies. They're not as conservative as they used to be. But um, when I was studying to be a minister, I started reading the fathers of the church and one thing led to another i met an orthodox priest through the pro-life movement as well and um and then i was uh, baptized in 1990 and um and the first my first parish was in rocor so i wasn't uh, someone who started off in one jurisdiction and came to rocor i started off in rocor and have been there uh, ever since and um i was made a deacon in uh, 1995 and uh, then I got a blessing to start our parish while I was still a deacon in 1998, and I was ordained a priest in January of 19, excuse me, 2001. And uh, we, uh, our parish is growing. We we bought property, I believe, it was in 2008, and then we built our current church in 2010. And now we need to build a new church because we're running out of space. So oh wow, that's that's great news. What, yeah. uh, which state is it in? In Texas. In Texas. Oh, great. Yeah. We don't we don't have Bryce right here, but he's from Texas as well. Um, who's normally in the podcast, but he's working. Um, Father, I have a question though. Did you have that that calling to be a priest from the start of your conversion or later on? Well, I felt called to be a minister while I was still a Protestant. So when I became Orthodox, I was hoping to eventually be ordained, although I knew that you know, the priest that baptized me made it clear that it takes a couple of years to develop an orthodox way of thinking and that for a couple of years, I shouldn't even think about teaching or doing anything like that. Um, and um, so, and the other thing is when I first started, was, I studied orthodoxy for about a year before I said anything to my wife about it because I wanted to make sure that's what I wanted to do before I started confusing her with an alternative and um, so when I finally did tell her that I was wanting to become Orthodox, she had a lot of catching up to do. And for a while, I was thinking she wasn't going to convert. And so I actually uh, enlisted in the Marine Corps before the first Gulf War, thinking if I can't oh. be a priest, I guess I'll go into the Marine Corps and, and fight <laughs> for my country. My father was a World War II veteran, so I kind of felt like, well, it was my turn. And I didn't know that our country lies us into wars all the time back then. Uh, so that's what I was, was in the direction of doing, but I was praying that if it wasn't God's will, that it wouldn't happen. And I wound up getting injured, uh, before oh. I went into boot camp. but it took the pressure off of my wife long enough for her to decide to convert on her own. And then she was baptized in, on bright Saturday in two, in uh, 1991. And, uh, so then after that, I was, uh, moving in the direction of preparing to be made a, a priest. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. it's a blessing to have you as a priest in our church that we all share. Um, well, the subject of today, Sola Scriptura. For those that don't know, Milos, because Bryce is not here today, so I'm going to ask you. Since uh -huh. you don't have a Protestant background, do you have any idea what it means? It's Latin, of course, so let's um, see how good your Latin is. Yeah, so Sola Scriptura basically, basically means uh, only using the scripture without the tradition of the church and uh, they disregard uh, a lot of the tradition that was like given by uh, per mouth you know like the tradition yes tradition what's the word for it if you tell oral me from tradition. Oral, the oral tradition oral, oral tradition. tradition thank you <laughs> my english sometimes stops working but, so but could you like literally Translate Sola Scriptura for me. Only Scripture. Indeed. 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 And Scripture, of course, being the Bible for a lot of Protestants. 
So now that did he did he explain that well, Father? Yes, that's. I mean, a a, a good Protestant, you know, who knew his theology would probably quibble with the definition a little bit because they would say, "Well, we don't disregard tradition; we just don't consider it to be binding on the conscience." Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is, is they use tradition when they want to, when it agrees with what they want to promote, and then when it doesn't agree with what they want to promote, they they feel free to discard it. Exactly. I think I think we've all been in debates uh, with Protestants, and and the main theme that I see is like, where does it say in the Bible? Where does that say? Where does it say that and that? Give me a verse. Give me a verse. Do you have a verse for that? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's 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 a common theme. I think I I think I'm not the only one that had that discussion ever in his life. Um, but can we like? Let's talk a little bit about it. Like how this, how did this belief came to be? Strahinha, do you know? Well, I would suppose by being somebody who has no Protestant background at all, that uh, as Lutherans in Germany were rebelling against the Catholics, they were very much into disregarding Catholic traditions because they saw many flaws in them. And then especially as you know the European immigrants went towards the new world uh, I mean speaking of like American Protestants speaking of America as the new world they had to develop their own traditions and uh, they they were just trying to be separate and different from the Catholic Church so I, I would guess that that's where it comes from so it's basically a reaction to tradition is that how it was formed well it's a reaction to a a distortion of tradition papism to be specific yes of course <laughs> well that is a distortion indeed um yeah we never had did we ever had that kind of movement in the orthodox church i know we had iconoclasm um, which is similar to the anti-imagery in church uh, of the protestants but did we ever had like a, like a bible only movement in the orthodox church not that um wasn't basically an importation of protestantism you know mm -hmm. you, you have baptists that have been in russia for centuries for example that and and you have a lot of accounts of orthodox clergy and saints that were combating their propaganda but uh, but these were things that were coming from the west and actually at the time of the protestant reformation both Re lutherans reformed uh, you know calvinists and Roman Catholics were slaughtering Anabaptists, mm -hmm. and the only the only countries that allowed those Baptists to come and live without being slaughtered was Holland and uh, the Russian Empire. So Russia gave these people the, the the freedom to live in their own communities. They didn't allow them to, to proselytize freely. But they were allowed to live there and uh, you know live their lives and 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 uh, worship in their own communities and uh, um, and not be killed. So I I think Baptist owe uh, Russia some gratitude, although you never hear them mention that. So they they, <laughs> they don't know their own history. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing like that in our own tradition where people have tried to take that position i mean you occasionally had people who would make an argument against some teaching and say that's not in the scriptures for example saint basil the great was responding to people who were denying that the holy spirit was a person and he made the argument well we have the doxology glory to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit and what mm -hmm. sense would it make to say glory to the father who's a person and the son who's a person and to the holy spirit that's not a person what, what sense would that make and their response was well that's not in the bible and that's where saint basil made his famous argument about unwritten traditions and um, you find that in his uh, treatise on the holy spirit and it also was incorporated into the canons of the church later on which is also like in the Bible, I think about tradition, about oral tradition. I think there's a verse about that. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, yeah. Second Thessalonians two fifteen says, "Hold go. fast with the traditions that you received from me, whether by word or our epistle." And that's talking about oral tradition and written uh, scripture. And also in First uh, Corinthians eleven, I think it's verse two. Uh, Saint Paul says, "I praise you that you follow traditions just as you receive them from us." 
So tradition is spoken about positively and negatively in scripture. But the question that dist what distinguishes praiseworthy traditions and, and uh, condemned traditions is the source. And St. Paul makes it clear that the source of the traditions that he was passing on was Christ and the apostles. And uh, the, the traditions that Christ condemns in the gospels are referred to as the traditions of men. So you can have bad traditions, but, uh, but when you're talking about the traditions that come from Christ and the apostles, they're equally binding on the conscience along with anything else you find in scripture. Exactly. And isn't the Bible, well, scripture itself, a, a result of tradition? In That's way. right. And, uh, you know, most Protestants <clears throat> historically have kind of thought of the Bible as almost like uh, the way Muslims think of the Quran, that it was basically yeah. just handed to, you know, the prophet one day, uh, you know, by the Archangel Gabriel, the King James Bible. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so yeah, everything was already settled. There was never any discussion about the text, but when you actually start studying the history of how the scriptures came to be, you start to discover that, yeah, actually there were thousands of years uh, in which the scriptures, basically every book has a history. And, and uh, if you take the books of Moses, for example, the tradition says that the prophet Moses was the author of those books, but they go back to the beginning of creation. So we're talking about thousands of years of oral tradition just in that mm -hmm. in the book of genesis and um so there obviously what these traditions were handed down orally and uh they they were shaped and preserved and we believe the holy spirit was guiding this process so if you believe the holy spirit can guide his people over thousands of years to maintain traditions that eventually found their way into scripture into a particular form and then also guide that community to know which texts really were scripture and which ones weren't there's not any reason why you shouldn't also assume that the holy spirit can guide the uh, church of the new testament to have traditions that come from the apostles that tell us what books of the new testament are authoritative and also tell us things that are not included in the new testament like how do you worship how do you do a sunday uh eucharistic service since it's talked about in the new testament but there's no how-to instructions of how to do it and what St. Basil points out is, is that the scriptures are public pro proclamation, mm. and uh, but but that there is also what he refers to as a secret tradition. And he doesn't mean secret in the Gnostic right. sense that only some people are aware of it, but, uh, but secret in the sense that only people in the church would have been aware of the details of it that preserved these things that involved the inner life of the church. And um, the liturgy certainly would have been one of those things. And when liturgical scholars study the services of the church, one thing that they find is that these services are clearly rooted in Jewish synagogue worship. And the question you have to ask is, is well, how did that happen? If the apostles were, if we're, aren't the source, there's no time in history where you could say, here's where the Christians would have looked over their sh the, the shoulder of the Jews and said, hey, let's copy what they're doing. Because even in the first century, by the end of the first century, relations between unchristian jews and the, the 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 christians had deteriorated to such a point that christians wouldn't have said hey the jews do cool stuff let's go do what they're doing <laughs> they would only have been doing what the jews were doing because it was already what they were doing because they got it from the apostles who were jewish and then that's that's the reason why these things were preserved exactly it's a continuation of that old jewish tradition basically right um yeah, and I think a lot of Protestants also forget that we didn't have any like compiled scripture or Bible for like a few hundred years. Like the early Christians didn't have anything. Well, they did have like scriptures, but separately, but also Gnostic, um, you know, texts. But the the Protestants indeed, like you said, they think that it just came into existence like the Quran did out of nowhere. And it's it's just funny that they don't know their own history. Uh or the history about the bible like they don't look at history they see the bible and they just think it exists and it's it's like exactly what i should follow um there's a very good short video on youtube uh, by a uh, middle eastern priest uh, middle eastern father i don't recall his name but he's recounting his experience coming to america and uh, he recounts this anecdote as he's on the plane with an american man who asks him are you christian first of all and he says yes 
And then he asks him, where are you from? And Fahad was from some Middle Eastern country and uh, I mean, probably close to the Holy Land. And uh, and the, the American asks him, when did you convert? Like in the last 10 years or what? And he has been he has been Christian. His tradition was Christian for a very long time. And then he goes on to say, well, what came first, the church or the scripture? And the church came first before, you know, we had the, the scripture we have today compiled the way we have it today. Indeed, it, it, that's very true. And and uh, I see in my own experience when Protestants start to look at that church history, they do change their minds. And that's why we see a lot of people, you know, with the information we have today available available to us on the internet, converting to Christianity. It's like in the hundreds, thousands, especially in the US, converting. Like, Father, you can probably give examples from in your church, like <laughs> uh, Laity that ha like we're protestants and we have our own example right here sky um <laughs> um yes. how did, were you a sola scripturist actually well, or did you care that much or are you asking him okay go ahead no scott i'm asking uh, sky okay well um when i was a protestant yes i was a practitioner in the five solas um <laughs> which is all but it's also I can't, I had a very different outlook. Like though I was told, okay, this is what I I just followed what I was like being told is true. Like oh yes, scripture alone, all this stuff. But I always had a I had a very I had a non-Protestant influence, I guess, in my life, coming from um, like both my my dad's side's Catholic because they're from Louisiana, so they were all French Catholics on that side, and then my. Um, my mom's side came from an Anglican background, which like an Anglican and Catholic background, but they ended up becoming Methodist at some point. And so, and then I settled at some Baptist megachurch for the longest time. So coming from that background, yeah, I, I, I had, I, though I had like, I firmly at one point believed in Sola Scriptura and all that stuff. And even like defended it to an extent, I always had like an, like from my family background, I always kind of like had a sense like, wait a second, this something doesn't make sense. And then I started looking more into history and church history and stuff. And then kind of realized like, wait, my Protestant Bible comes from like, I think it was like Masoretic texts, whereas the other one came from the Septuagint. And I was like, wait, which one's older? And I tried to go back and back and back farther and farther until eventually coming to the conclusion of orthodoxy. And yeah, that's where I came from. Did, did you have a similar experience, Father? Yeah, I, what I was raised uh, in, on the ground anyway, it was Sola Scriptura. When I became, when I started studying to be a minister, I discovered that on a theoretical level, the Church of the Nazarene does at least allow for some authority for tradition because the Nazarenes come from the Methodists who come from the Anglicans. And the Anglicans uh, believe in, in in tradition as at least being the primary way you interpret scripture. Uh, they basically say that scripture, the Anglicans say scripture is interpreted by tradition and reason. And uh, the Methodists, which were founded by John Wesley, added experience also that you interpret it with experience. But basically, mm -hmm. tradition was the most the, the first thing that you're supposed to use when you interpret scripture. It's just they usually didn't really do it that way. What they usually did was they just interpreted it on their own. And only when they were defending things like the doctrine of the Trinity, did they care about what the fathers had to say. Yeah. We'll get into that a little bit more later. Uh, I want to dive into the dangers of solo scripture and like why it is wrong. Um, yeah. Milos, maybe since you don't yeah. know, or I you have do some, know. Yeah, I have some good points what the dangers of that would be. Um, we already mentioned uh, how the Eucharist should be done. All of those things that are like the oral traditions of the church. <clears throat> and another big thing is with all of those traditions being uh, lost in the Sola Scriptura, it becomes somewhat empty, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. Like my friend Sky here once said, it's like the Protestants are 
just doing it with the heart and the pape is just with their uh, mind and in orthodoxy you have both the mind and the heart in the church and with that being said without the without the, all of those traditions you lose the eucharist uh, how it's uh, supposed to be done you lose a lot of the dogmas because we have a lot of dogmas that are by oral tradition and uh, whether it's how the service is supposed to be done or specific stuff that are supposed to be done in the church and uh, a lot of other traditions like in daily life whether it's how to do the sign of the cross whether it's how to pray uh, pray at home or another thing like the um our icons that we have in our churches and the at home and the way we burn incense there are like so many uh multiple things that will be lost with with just having solar scriptura that's why i recommend everyone who might be still protestant and watching this video uh please check out some of the older traditions of the church and please uh, invest a lot of time into uh, into the church history because you will find out that it, there were a lot of stuff being lost yes yeah. very true i was gonna say just add one last thing sorry and if you guys need book recommendations we have them as well we have plenty of great <laughs> book recommendations if you guys like to read also strahina you're um, you had a little bit of background i just want to let you know so, uh, and another great yeah, source would be bit. Father Father John Whiteford's uh, articles. You can find them online. They're also very good to read. Uh, and his books as well. Yeah, <laughs> he wrote a whole book on Sola Scriptura. So, uh, you know, uh, definitely get that as well. But uh, I want to talk about a different danger. It's the nitpicking. I've seen that a lot of Sola Scripturists nitpick a lot of verses. And we've already did a podcast about iconography. And one of the dangers of nitpicking is looking at the commandments, looking, oh, wait, no graven images. So all these images in these churches are idolatry. But if you read a few, a few verses after the commandments, you see that God himself commanded the Israelites to make uh, cherubs on the... Um, was it the tabernacle or the old, the covenant? It's the, it's the walls because they were like golden plates and everything. And the, and then yeah, they have it on top of also the on top of the ark of the covenant. Yeah, and the ark of the covenant as well. So it's the nitpicking that's dangerous. And another danger is it it gives rise to these movements to false teachers. Well, let's look at the Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> um, they, you know, they 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 believe in the one hundred and forty four thousand saved, if that's the number. I'm not sure. Um, and all these these movements that believe in Sola Scriptura, they all interpret the Bible in their own way. And that's why Protestantism, it's split in thousands of different factions as well. Because it's their personal interpretation and they all claim their interpretation is true. And they all claim that the Holy, that they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. But by claiming that as a Protestant, by claiming Sola Scriptura, that's kind of blasphemy. If you think that um, Holy Spirit inspires you and the other one doesn't, but they are Sola Scriptura as well. So who's right here? You know? Mm. And if you go back to the beginnings of the Protestant movement during the times of Luther, the fights already started there. While they didn't even uh, become Protestants. Yeah. And, Just and... during the movement of trying to fix uh, the problems of the Vaticans, already there was the infighting. Yeah, and a friend of us, Jared, said, like, I was getting tired of the Bible studies in my Protestant church because all they did was fight about their interpretation of these verses. <laughs> it's like it wasn't like and like it wasn't fruitful at all. <laughs> and that's one of the other dangers. Maybe you have some more, Father. I don't know. Well, I would say that I mean that's the, the private interpretation is the is the key one because Saint Peter tells us that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. And yet that's exactly what Protestants do. 
basically when they reacted to papism, their reaction was, why should only one person get to be the Pope? Every man should be the Pope. And so that's what you have in Protestantism. And within Martin Luther's own lifetime, you already had dozens of sects that had broken off into their own direction. And some of them were pretty wild. I mean, this is not something when you, when I was growing up as a Protestant, I never heard about these uh, radical Protestant sects that, uh, that, that came onto the scene, but there were some that were teaching free love. Uh, some were violent. Uh, there were all kinds of heresies, even by Protestant standards that were being promoted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, you had the peasants revolt in Luther's lifetime. And a lot of this was motivated by people who were coming up with their own interpretation of scripture. And rather than having any basis to say, well, if you just look at chapter such and such a book, so and so, and uh, read this, you'll be refuted. Martin Luther basically appealed to the power of the state and said that they needed to stab, smite, and slay these people because they were being rebellious. And that, and this this revolt was mostly in the southern part of Germany, which is why, after in reaction to what Luther did, that's the the Catholic part of Germany. That's the part that didn't become Lutheran because they they resented uh, the position that he took, and they wound up becoming staunch Catholics, even though if you look at the Protestant Reformation, it mostly spread in areas where people spoke a non-Latin based language, because obviously they had a harder time understanding Latin. And that's mm -hmm. what the services had to be in, in the in the Roman Catholic Church at that time. Uh, but that was one part of the Germanic speaking world that uh, stayed Roman Catholic, because they didn't appreciate being stabbed, uh, sm smitten and slain uh, and, uh, when, just because they had a different interpretation of the scriptures. Yeah. I live in such a country myself. I, I, I live in the Netherlands, so I, I'm very familiar with, uh, Protestantism, even though Protestantism in the end leads to atheism. We can look at my own country where I live right now. It's let's say for maybe more than half of the population is atheist. I'm sure. And the others are agnostic or Muslim. So you can see where Protestantism leads you eventually. Protestantism inevitably leads to skepticism because the problem Protestants ran into very early on is you had all these people coming up with different interpretations of the Bible. So the problem was, well, how do you, how do you go about finding the right interpretation since everybody's coming up with their own interpretation? So the answer was, well, if you just study enough Greek and Hebrew, and if you just learn all the skills of great scholars and, and apply them to the scriptures, then you'll be able to come to the right conclusion. But that it didn't work either. You know, that, that, that certainly didn't solve the problem. And eventually it led to scholars analyzing the scriptures to a point where they started to take them apart and no longer believe that they were really in, in, in infallible or even inspired. And so essentially they peeled the onion and at the, at the end of the day, there was nothing left of the onion. They just kept taking one layer after the next and then eventually got to the end and there was nothing there. Exactly. And um, how I see it nowadays, the, the Protestants see the Bible as an idol in my experience. They literally treat it like an idol and they don't see it, right? Well, one interesting thing, especially when you're talking about iconography and veneration of icons is, is I remember as a child, it basically pledge, it, it, was, it was the Pledge of Allegiance to the Bible. I can't remember the word, I can't remember it word for word, but they would put a Bible in front of the class. We'd say the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag, and then we'd say the Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag, uh, the Protestant Christian flag. And then we would put our hands over our heart and we'd say, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word, a light into my path and a, and a, and a light into my feet or something like that. And uh, I, I, I will hide its word in my heart that I may not sin against God. Sin against God. That was, it was something along those lines. But basically, we were, we were venerating the Bible. We were looking at a, at a physical Bible. We were putting our hands over our heart. And we were saying that we're pledging allegiance to this book. Yeah, and, uh, literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a lot it's, of Protestants it. do that to this day. Yeah, it's amazing. It's I don't know. I don't, I don't understand them at all. Like I don't come from a Protestant background. I may have thought a little bit 
like the Sola Scripturates during my teenage years to my rebellious years. I'm like, that's not in the Bible. I don't need these college, win college windows, etc. You know. Yeah. But as I start start diving deep into history, since I study history now as well, I changed my view completely, and I see that it was the good thing to do eventually and that's why we see it mainly in the south in the u.s as well we see that the more liberal states they all go towards atheism now but the south you know they're ba the baptists mainly in the u.s and in florida as well it's like sky lives where he lives um <laughs> they all turn to orthodoxy mainly because they still do have that belief um but they search for something more, like they hunger for something better, which Protestantism cannot give them. Right, right. Yeah, there's a there's a wave of conversions right now that's something like I've never seen before, and uh, I have people contacting me every week and showing up at my church that are interested in becoming Orthodox. And if I had a bigger church, I think more of them would stay. <laughs> <laughs> We're bursting well, the seams, and we need to build a bigger church. But glory to God. Churches in town tell me the same things happening to them too. Yeah, well, I've I mean, been hearing it everywhere. I was going to say that's a great <laughs> problem to have when your church is yeah, too yeah, small. Exactly. <laughs> My parish is pretty empty, uh, sadly, here in France. So, well, that's that's the problem in Europe, um, I think as well. But mainly because most information is online in English as well. A lot of pe these people do have access to the like more information more and more information about the orthodox church in english which also helps a lot i see a lot of converts in england as well so i think that's partly the case since most people in france where you live over in france they don't speak english that well so the, they might not um go dive deep into that or you know they have a catholic um culture which makes it a little bit more harder to switch in my opinion mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, on Friday, yeah. I talked with a very good friend of mine after we went to play some uh, billiard and, and some pool and some darts. And we were talking about uh, the church, the parish we go to. He's cradle orthodox like me. And funny enough, his name is also Milos. So shout out to from Milos to Milos right now. <laughs> <laughs> and he was talking about me, how many Americans are converting to orthodoxy. Like he doesn't, his English is very bad. He doesn't see this stuff online. He watches our videos, but he just leaves them somewhere in the background because he doesn't understand anything we are saying. <laughs> so just that we get one view, very nice of him. And he was shocked how many people are converting in the US and that's how fast it's growing. He saw somewhere a report on the Serbian TV, on the main TV about uh, orthodoxy in the u.s so just that the people know that uh, that even we in europe are aware of the big conversion in the U u.s and we are very happy about it and glory to god like Kai yeah said, it's, it's a great problem to have if your parish is not big enough for that many people and you have to it's, yeah it's becoming a beacon bigger. of orthodoxy in the u.s and and i'm, I'm really glad to see that as it is deteriorating in Europe a little bit. And it's the fastest growing in Australia as well, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Absolutely amazing. Glory to God. So let's talk a, lot, a little bit about like the last subject about what's the right way to interpret scripture. Uh, maybe the father can tell us a little bit about that more. Well, you have to interpret scripture in the context of the wider tradition that preserved it because we wouldn't have a, a Bible if the church hadn't preserved it. And we have to believe if we're Christians that the Holy Spirit was behind that process. But we also believe the Holy Spirit was behind the process of preserving what the text meant. And um, so we have a tradition of what the, what the scriptures actually mean. So that we're not just having to guess. And the way the Protestants approach a passage in the Bible is it's kind of like an archaeological dig or a crime scene investigation where they're trying to put together pieces of evidence and look at bone fragments or whatever to try to figure out what happened here. You know, what should we make of this scene? Whereas in the Orthodox Church, our understanding of Scripture is like we know the author. And so we can ask the author, hey, when you wrote this, what did you mean exactly? And they can explain it to you. Or if you had a professor who wrote the textbook you're using in class, 
and you had a question about the textbook, you could ask the professor and say, what does this mean? And you would know when he explained it to you that this was the right interpretation of that because he's the guy who wrote the book. And the church wrote the book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is still the, the guide and the pilot of the church. And so we still have that um, ability to, to consult that tr living tradition to find out what these things mean. Exactly. And get yourself an Orthodox study Bible. You can, uh, you can, I think Sky has it. I have it myself. Even though I'm Greek, I like, I prefer reading it in English for some reason. But there's some great commentary in those, um, in the Bible, uh, the Orthodox study Bible. And we always look at, you know, the commentary of the church fathers. Uh, you have this app, if you cannot afford a, a physical Bible, there's an app called uh, Katina Bible app with a C, Katina, um, which you can download and it's the whole Bible, but you can select certain traditions that you want to see the, the explanation of the verses. And you can just click on Byzantine tradition and you'll have the church fathers and other saints as well that give their commentaries on on certain uh, verses. So never read the Bible by yourself. Well, you can read it by yourself, but just you know, tag the church fathers along with you. <laughs> um, I forgot which priest said that online, but he said something once along those lights, uh, lines. When in doubt, look what the church father said. <laughs> so that's, I think, always a good advice on that topic as well. Yep. And I think even the, the Orthodox Study Bible is available online in, you, as PDF. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we have an abundance of information nowadays and definitely put it to good use. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add one thing that also, um, that I was thinking of earlier and it was, um, another thought that kept on going into my head back when I was Protestant. And it was just this urge. Cause I there was, I was frustrated with how many denominations there were. I was frustrated with all these different thoughts. Like, why does this person have to think like this, this, and this? And I thought to myself, listen, I, I was reading, I think I was reading St. Paul's like epistles at the time. And I was like, I, I don't want to know what John over here says. I don't want to know what John over this believes this is. I want to know what St. Paul himself meant by this. Like, I, I like, I don't want to know all these, or I don't want to know all that. And that truly like drove me. I believe like just searching for what St. Paul said, what this, all the saints say about um, Holy scripture and in Holy scripture and their writings and stuff said. So that way I could, get the true the right interpretation and the right view so yeah the right phronema there we go the right indeed and it's just also important that to say that protestants don't in my experience they don't really read the bible like we said all those verses they just skip over it and i think then they remove a few books as well from the bible father they removed what we often refer to as the deuterocanonical books, which are the books that uh, are not in the Hebrew canon, but are in the Orthodox canon. The, the Roman Catholic canon has a few fewer books than we do, uh, but uh, the Orthodox Study Bible has the complete canon. Yeah. Uh, the Book of James. Do they have the Book of James? They do, although Martin <laughs> Luther actually for a while argued that it should be removed because he, he called it an epistle of straws because it contradicted one of his favorite teachings, which was uh, sola fide or faith alone, because in the book of uh, James, it says, so you see that we're not justified by faith alone. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it, it's pretty hard to say you believe in faith alone and you believe in the Bible when the Bible, the only time it says faith alone is when it says we are not justified by faith alone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and I also want to mention Sola Scriptura is not in the Bible. Tradition is. <laughs> so right. Sola Scriptura refutes itself, basically, if you think about it. Right. Even Protestant apologists have to admit that during the time the apostles were still alive, Sola Scriptura could not possibly have functioned because the apostles were still around and they were teaching. So what they have to say is, well, it came into being when the last apostle died and they no longer had apostles to consult. 
so you're saying, okay, it came into being when the New Testament was finished, so therefore it's not taught in the New Testament, so therefore it's not biblical, so therefore Sola Scriptura would say Sola Scriptura can't be true. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I don't, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I really don't understand how you stay like Protestant and knowing all that stuff, but. I well, think for it's me, for personal gain as well. I, when I read the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch, that was when I decided I could no longer be a Protestant. I wasn't sure what I was going to become. But here mm -hmm. you have the disciple of the Apostle John, and he says all these things about what the church, the nature of the church is, what the nature of the Eucharist is. Uh, he says that no one who follows another into a schism will inherit the kingdom of God. And these are all things that Protestants don't believe uh, because Protestantism is nothing but a collection of schisms. They have no concept of schism. If I was still a Protestant, I could go down the street and start a new denomination tomorrow. And if, as long as I taught uh, a few basic things that most evangelicals accept, they would have to accept me as a legitimate church. Uh, so th th there's no concept of schism. And yet a disciple, the Apostle John says, if you go into schism, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That sounds like a pretty big deal, but that is a big disconnect. Uh, so when I finished reading his epistles, I knew I didn't belong to the same church that he did. And I figured he had to be in the right one and I had to be in the wrong. So I wanted to be in the church that he was in. <laughs> did you did you think about becoming a Roman Catholic at all? Well, not not at that time. I actually, when I was in junior high school, got interested in Roman Catholicism and and took a Knights of Columbus correspondence course back in the pre-internet days mm -hmm. because I was curious about it. But And th there were things I thought were attractive about it, but I could never square it with what I saw in the Bible. And so when I started looking at the apostolic tradition, you know, if, I, if I'd have seen stuff that supported Roman Catholicism, I probably would have reconsidered it, but it wasn't something that was on the top of my radar screen. I like for about maybe 10 seconds thought about becoming an Anglican, but you know, if the Anglicans <laughs> were like they were a hundred years prior to that time, I might've become an Anglican because they used to believe in God and stuff, but they don't anymore. They have bishops that deny the resurrection. Now they have, you uh, know, transgendered uh, lesbian, you know, whatever bishops. Uh, so they're not, a, yeah. they're not something that you could seriously uh, entertain. If you, if you take the Bible seriously, so for me, orthodoxy was the, the move to the top of the list. But I, you know, I had my issues that I had to resolve first. But one by one, I started to resolve them because I started to, to using, the, you know, the, 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 the idea that tradition was the primary interpreter of scripture, that the Anglican and, and Methodist tradition had passed on to, to my denomination. I thought, well, how, what has the church always taught about these things? And that's, I started digging in and one by one, these issues went by the wayside and then I decided to become Orthodox. And then I started to tell my wife about it. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God that she was open to it as well. Yeah. She wasn't so open at first, but you know, oh. <laughs> maybe another year later, she, she was, she converted. Well, it, it definitely takes time. And that's why, yeah. you know, being a catechumen for a lot of people, it, you know, it's a long period, but it's an important yeah. period. And a lot of people are like, why do I have to be a catechumen for like a year before I can be can get baptized? It's because you need to, you know, you need to learn. <laughs> you cannot just be Orthodox out of nowhere. It's not how it works. Well, if you if you look, compare a wedding service and the baptism service with the making of a catechumen being real, you know, part of that, the making of a catechumen is analogous to the betrothal. And we have a period where you're a catechumen for the same reason why you have a period where you're engaged to be married before you actually get married. And that's because you need to find out what it is that you're getting ready to do <laughs> before exactly. you do it. Yeah. Uh, the, ch the church is a bride. <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, yeah, amazing. Orthodoxy so, is a way of life. That's why it takes so long. Right. It's not an easy way. It's not an easy life, but it's the uh, right life. That everybody right. should choose. It's the right way. The royal, the royal path. path. <laughs> Once again. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Indeed. So, yeah. So, uh, well, uh, 
about the Anglicans, I think they're going for the gender neutral pronoun for God as well. It's insane. I don't know what's happening. If C.S. Lewis was alive today, he would have converted to orthodoxy for sure. I believe so. What's what's kind of hilarious is the, the woke white people have in the last several years started talking about how we need to amplify the voices of people of color. And yet we have these liberal denominations that, you know, in the last couple hundred years converted a bunch of colored people in Africa and Latin America and in Asia. And uh, the Anglicans in England and the United States have gone absolutely insane, but the colored people that are that converted to Anglicanism and, and, and are, are actually the more traditional Anglicans that are saying, hey, we're not going along with that. And in the Methodist church, they actually tried to pass a resolution to allow for gay marriage and all that, but it was all these overseas Methodists that said no way. And so, but, but rather than amplify the voices of people of color, all these white liberals decide, well, hey, we need to get rid of all these color people that are telling us we can't do what we want to do. <laughs> and now they're splitting. They're, they're, they're dividing the denomination. Yeah. It's a split upon a split upon a split. Uh, you know, exactly. that's what Protestant so it's like chopping if wood. I may add, like, in my opinion, every time there is a group of people that want to form an empire, they will form their own brand of Christianity, just like the Papists did, just like the Protestants did, you know, just like the Anglicans did. And sadly, they, they have to, you know, like, try and impose new fake ideology. And so now that these people are trying to create a new world for themselves, are kind of trying to reform Europe and, and America, North America, to their own liking, they are starting, you know, to implement their own ideology into church. And uh, that's that's really sad because if they were Christian, you know, and if they were following uh, God and following, you know, the traditions as they should, they would not be doing any of the stuff that they are doing. So it's like a whole spectrum thing. These people who are also reforming the church to to these modern things, you know, th their politics are also corrupt. Their, you know, economics are also corrupt. Their whole way of life and their vision of where they are going in life is not at all the same as ours. Definitely. Um, I also want to say the papists do also a little bit of solo scripturing now, like like now and then. For example, the you know the whole Peter's the Rock, um, verse is like they're interpreting that verse by themselves in a literal way, in my opinion. So I've always said like you're interpreting this verse like a protestant <laughs> you know like a protestant would and mm -hmm. as you can see the protestants you know they 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 even influence uh some other people that don't know a lot about theology nowadays i've seen a lot of orthodox people also just you know reading the bible without the church father because they don't know what they're supposed to do uh so because of the internet influence of protestantism they they constantly just post verses, and especially the women. I don't want to talk about, about it more. About. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I'm sorry. It's I'm true, sorry but... because I was I was thinking of a girl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, so we need to do. <laughs> I think we need to to do better, uh, especially as men as well, to you know educate uh, the credo orthodox, the newcomers everyone else well we want to encourage people to read the bible and there are some orthodox that in sort of a reaction to protestantism take this attitude well i don't need to read the bible i just read the church fathers and stuff like that mm. and usually they don't really read the fathers that much and they don't read the bible at all but you can't understand the fathers if you don't know the bible because the fathers are con constantly talking about the bible um I've just for Lent decided to listen on uh, uh, LibriVox to a recording of St. Augustine's Confessions. Mm -hmm. And one thing that struck me listening to these recordings is just how often St. Augustine is alluding to different scriptures that if you didn't know your Bible, you wouldn't be aware that he's almost uh, paraphrasing some passage of scripture in every statement. And, uh, so you have to know the Bible. Otherwise, you think he's just coming up with these 
these images on his own, but he's not. He's he's very often paraphrasing things right out of the Psalms or other things that are in Scripture, and uh, and just you know working them together to make a particular point. Uh, but uh, another thing Saint Augustine says about reading the Bible that I think is helpful to people who maybe don't have access to a lot of writings of the fathers easily, although the Katina app is a great way to get that access. So I encourage people mm-hmm. to use that too. But St. Augustine said, if you interpret the Bible in a way that is conforms to the teachings of the church, you're never going to go too far wrong. And, and there are parts of the Old Testament, for example, where you're not going to find any patristic commentary on, at least I've been able to find it in English. Uh, so you, if you're only going to interpret things according to what the fathers literally say about them, then you wouldn't know what to do with those passages. But what you do with those passages, you interpret it in a way that's in conformity with the rest of the tradition of the church. And uh, you might not have the absolutely perfect interpretation of every passage, but you're not going to be too far wrong. Exactly. And I think that's a that's a great way to end this this podcast. Father, I want to thank you so much for coming on to our um, little project. <laughs> well, you're so we yeah, we 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 are honored um we have been honored to have you here um I, everybody you should read the blog um mm-hmm. we might need the exact link from you uh because well, my parish website is saint spelled out s-a-i-n-t jonah j-o-n-a-h dot org and if you go to the article section you'll find articles that are linked directly from the the website but also a link to the blog which is a blog spot it's like father spelled out john.blogspot.com um but uh you know i i write new articles with a somewhat regular uh uh in somewhat regular intervals on my blog but the bigger articles i've written are listed separately on that articles page and actually the soul script tour the original version of it anyway not the book form which is actually out of print so it's not so easy to get Although oh. it's, it's still in print in German and in Russian, I believe, uh, okay. but uh, uh, but the but the original version is on there in English, and it's also on there in about six or seven other languages too. That's great. So definitely mm. check that out, guys, um, if you're interested in that. I think you also are an ancient faith. Is that right? Yeah, they post my sermons when they don't uh, get too controversial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i know about that so um indeed thank you all for being here um and thank you for watching books. yep yeah. check out uh we're we're releasing a new website very soon yes so also look look out for that we're working on it very hard um and um thank you so watching guys god bless